All right, welcome to The Value and Creativity of Queer Stories. Uh, our book panel is part of Vancouver Pride's pop-up Pride events, uh, which are running all week. For more information, you can visit vancouverpride.ca slash events. Uh, as we begin, I do want to acknowledge that we are meeting on the unceded and traditional lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. Uh, for Warcat Reads, reconciliation is more than a ceremonial acknowledgement. Um, it's also an opportunity to learn about the true history of this land um, and acknowledge the unjust treatment of the people whose lands we occupy, uh, both in the past and today. Uh, my name is Trisha McGuera, and I'm really excited to be here tonight. I'm one half of Roarcat Reads, which is a queer and nerdy website and community in Vancouver. Uh, we focus a lot on books, D&D, &D, and cats, uh, and it's the book part that brings us here tonight. Uh, I'm here with a uh, few local authors. We've got Michelle Osgood, uh, Danny Ramadan, and Tanya Botejou. Uh, so I want to just bring up quickly that we are going to have uh, two drawings for $25 book gift certificates to Iron Dog Books. We'll be doing a drawing for that around 7.30, so get excited. Um, but I want to get to know each of you and to hear a little bit about um, the books that you have written, and I think in some cases, books that you are working on and releasing soon. Uh, so let's start with Michelle Osgood. Uh, you are the author of the Better to Kiss You With series, uh, which includes the Better to Kiss You With, Huntsman and Moon Illusion. Uh, they're really adorable. I have enjoyed reading them so much. Um, I guess I would kind of describe them as queer feminist fantasy romance novels, um, and they were just so much fun. So I know you have a reading prepared for us today. Is there anything else you want to tell us about your work before, before we get to that? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the introduction, Tricia. Um, I just would say they're all set in Vancouver, so if that's something you're interested in. So am I. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to read a bit from my first book, The Better to Kiss You With, uh, just from chapter four. Wow, Deanna said, still laughing. I can't believe you knew that there are 37 subspecies of Canis lupus. I mean, who knows that? They were walking home from Darby's public house after trivia night, and their teammates had headed in other directions or bummed a ride from Nathan. Since that was about the only answer I got right all night, I wouldn't be too impressed, Jamie demurred. No one else knew it though. Deanna shook her head, exhilarated at their win. The night was chilly but clear, and although neither of them had gloves on, they both walked with their hands at their sides, when it would have been easiest to tuck their cold fingers into their pockets. The narrow sidewalk meant that they could either walk one behind the other, or, as they were, close enough that with every other step, Deanna felt Jamie's arm graze her own. It was imagined, Deanna knew, but she could almost swear she felt heat at every accidental touch. And the touches weren't accidental, not entirely. She hadn't been sure if her attraction to Jamie had been reciprocated. Tonight had definitely confirmed that it was. They'd spent the night beside each other, squished thigh to thigh in a small booth with five of Deanna's friends. And even when Max ducked out as soon as the quiz had ended, leaving Jamie with room to move over, she hadn't moved away. She'd stayed, pressed long and lean against Deanna's side as they'd enjoyed the free pitcher their win had earned them. Hyper aware of the press of Jamie's leg against her own, the light fabric of her dress and Jamie's jeans, all that was between them, Deanna had found it difficult to follow the conversation. Once, Jamie had leaned back, casually, and there'd been the light touch of an arm against Deanna's back. Nathan had met her eyes across the table and quickly, secretly grinned before asking their teammate Sadie how her house hunting was going. Deanna had let the conversation wash over her then, nursing the rest of her beer, and after several moments of agonizing internal debate, had slowly leaned back. She'd given Jamie plenty of time to move her arm if she wanted, but apparently Jamie hadn't. It was as though Deanna was reliving her first childhood crush all over again as she felt Jamie's arm warm and steady against her shoulders. Now, as they walked home in the dark, Deanna decided it was time to stop beating around the bush. The next time Jamie's hand brushed her own, she caught the other woman's fingers. Jamie didn't hesitate. Her fingers wrapped firmly around Deanna's own, 
and Deanna was sure that without that solid grip, she'd have floated straight up into the night sky. She ducked her head to hide her grin and caught Jamie's glance out of the corner of her eye. Deanna should say something, probably, but it was so unbearably sweet to just walk hand in hand that she couldn't bring herself to speak. They walked the final blocks to their building in silence, and it was the furthest thing from uncomfortable as Jamie's thumb slid casually over Deanna's wrist. The light touch sent Deanna's senses skittering until it felt as if all the nerves in her body had gathered in that one spot. When they reached their building and Jamie pulled her hand away to reach for her keys, Deanna had to take a deep breath of the cool air to keep from pushing Jamie against the glass doors and taking a fistful of Jamie's short hair so she could drag Jamie's mouth down to hers. As though Jamie could read Deanna's mind, she cast a glance back over her shoulder. A gleam of heat in her eyes had every muscle in Deanna's body pulled tight. Deanna tried to maintain a neutral expression, but the knowing tilt in Jamie's chin nearly undid her. Thank you. Oh, that was great. I like the start of that reading that hints a little bit at a, a, a theme of the book. <laughs> it's werewolves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, Danny, I'd like you to go next if that's all mm. right. Uh, you're the author of The Clothesline Swing, uh, which mm -hmm. I have read and is a beautiful uh, book about immigration and uh, trauma and death and also finding um, beauty in the midst of that and, and purpose and meaning. Um, I'd love for you to read, I think not from the clothesline swing, but from uh, the book that is coming out. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So uh, thank you so much for hosting me. I really appreciate it. As you said, my name is Daniel Ramadan and my pronouns are he and him. Uh, and I'm thankful that I'm talking to you today from the unceded territories of the Muslim, Squamish and Tsleil Truth people. As an immigrant, as a refugee, somebody who came here from Syria, um, it's important to me to do the land acknowledgement um, as I step tenderly on this land that I wasn't invited to participate in colonizing. Um, yes, I have written The Clothesline Swing, which was the book that um, made me famous, I guess. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good book that I really love. Uh, all the gifts that it keeps on giving. Uh, but today I am going to treat you to uh, one of the very first times that I'm reading from the Foghorn Echoes. Uh, the Foghorn Echoes is a novel coming out in August 2022, which is this year, I assume. I don't know. Time doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, and it's uh, a novel about two queer Syrian refugees. Uh, one is uh, internally displaced and lives in Damascus. Uh, the other is um, a refugee here in Canada who lives in Vancouver. Um, and they share a common trauma in their past. And each of them is dealing with that trauma their own way. So the one in Damascus has locked his doors upon himself and chose isolation. And the one in Vancouver has opened all the doors and windows and chose escapism. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is from uh, Hossam. His name is Hossam. And he is from Vancouver. He's writing from Vancouver. My father stands in the corner of the club angry, dark-featured, hard eyes and sharp fingers pointing at me. Our eyes lock and he flickers in the jolting beams of light like a broken neon sign. His face is never obstructed by the sea of shirtless bodies dancing to the pulsing beat. In one flash, my father smiles at me and in the next, his face is streaked with blood. I didn't kill you. I hiss through clenched teeth, the words lost in the throb of the DJ's music. I bob my head to the beat and my fingers find the little baggie in my pocket. I look away from my father to the faces of my friends dancing in the crowd. 
Michael makes out with a random, pulling him closer and grabbing his ass. He kisses him with opened eyes, their blue turn transparent in the black light and glows like a demon's. Our eyes meet, but his smile is half blocked by the random. I look away. Brian takes to, uh, tries to take a selfie with all of us. He hates photos taken with the front facing camera on his phone, so grainy and blurred. So he uses the back instead, clicking blindly on his screen before flipping the phone around and studying his handiwork. He looks disappointed and wants to take another. The DJ slams the air with his fist as he spins another rendition of some unintelligible voice echoing syllables over and over. Whoop, whoop, whoop. The beat drops and every, everyone jumps and as they land, the earth shakes and my father's ghost reappears under the spotlight, shattered, broken, his tibia rocketed through the muscle and skin and clothes pointing at me. The boys dance around him like wolves circling prey. I shudder. My hands squeeze the baggy, sweaty and slippery in my palm. Again, I see Wasim's foot hitting my father's face on that damn rooftop. I'm gonna pause here. The two of them, um, were making out on a rooftop 10 years earlier in the book and the father found out about it and then a fight ensured and by mistake one of them pushed the father off the rooftop. The memory shakes as if electricity runs through my eyes. The music is muffled, the vocalist barely audible and the faces around me blurred. There's my feet kicking my father's face. It's Wasim's feet kicking my father's face. It's my feet kicking Wasim's face. It's his feet kicking me. My feet, his feet, my feet, his feet. It's both of us. Oop, oop, oop. My phone vibrates in my pocket. I ignore it. It vibrates again. I pull it out and see a blinding sky blue and Arda's name under a photo I took of him. Big smile, white teeth, the color of his military uniform unbuttoned and showing his chest hair. Can't, I text him, I'll call you later. He texts me a heart emoji. I look up and my father's ghost has gone. He won't return this time, I know it. The music fills the air, beats me, meant, excuse me, Beats meant to raise my heartbeat and sounds meant to turn me on. It's computer generated. No actual music instruments were harmed in the making of this song. I giggle at my own joke. I slam into someone. I'm alert. My naked upper body brushes against the soft hair of his chest. I smile my crooked smile, narrow pupils, shifty eyes, an amused look on his face, his high. The universe send waves of sounds back to Earth. I am stoned for sure. I've seen it on the news. The universe has been speaking to us and for millions of years, we hadn't been able to hear it. Whoop, whoop, whoop. What a stupid sound it makes. It echoes like the bass in this DJ set. It's been speaking to us and we couldn't hear it because we're deaf to its song. Two black holes, I've seen it on the news, and on the opposite ends of the universe collapsed into each other millions of years ago and released the energy of a million billion suns into the dark, silent space around them. They crashed like two eggs rolling in a ball, and the waves vibrated across the whole galaxy. They merged into a bottomless pit, eating at planets and aimless rocks, the sound of death got weaker and softer and sharper until it reached Earth. Scientists recorded it. I've heard it on the news and they say it goes whoop, whoop, whoop. Such a dumb sound. These waves remain despite the years. They won't go away. My father's ghost is back glimmering in the corner. I have failed at erasing him. 
I am cursed forever. I am doomed for death. I avenged you, I whispered, but he won't go away. One more hit and he'll be gone. One more round, another bloody red bill. The boy strokes the hair on the back of my neck. What's your name? He asks. Hossam. Hisham? Hossam. Ahmed? Huh? Huh? Just call me Sam. Thank you. Wow, thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Uh, the Foghorn Echo is coming out in August. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Tanya, um, I'm excited to hear your reading. Um, you're the author of Kings, Queens, and In-Betweens, as well as uh, Bruised. I believe the excerpt is coming from Bruised. Um, and it is, I believe, my favorite coming out scene of anything ever. Um, your books are full of joy and celebration, even when they're they're dealing with topics that are quite difficult. Um, and I feel like this coming out scene was just the epitome of that. So I'm very excited to, to hear. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And so um, wonderful to be with this crew of folks and also just mesmerized by our wonderful ASL interpreters too. Thank you to you both. Um, I am going to read from Bruise, which just came out last year. It's about a girl who has lost her parents to a car accident that she survived. And she's taken to bruising herself as a form of coping with her grief. And so when a friend introduces her to roller derby, uh, which is a pretty brutal sport, uh, she sees it as an opportunity for more bruising, but she finds out that it's a lot more than that, of course. Um, but this scene is um, also one of my favorite scenes to, to read, um, especially at queer events, um, because it's very full of queer joy. Um, it's when uh, Daya, the main character, um, has just spent her first night with a girl. Um, and they are trying to sneak out of the house that Daya now lives in with her uncle and aunt, who are very over the top musical loving people um, and very opposite to who Daya is. <laughs> and so um, she's trying to escape before they can find out, uh, but they find out and this is their reaction. Suddenly Vicky was back on her feet. You know what? This calls for a capital C celebration. She disappeared into the living room, leaving Shanti and me speechless and Priam grinning from ear to ear at us as though he knew exactly what Vicky was about to do, which I can't imagine he actually did. And then music started playing from the living room, seasons of love from Rent. A minute later, Vicky swept back into the kitchen with two small rainbow flags on sticks because obviously, she had a secret stash of tiny rainbow flags somewhere. She poked these into the middle of the avocado toast sitting untouched on Shanti's and my plates. Then she joined Priam on the other side of the table and they began to sing along with the song. They were serenading us, celebrating our gayness. Shanti would never want to come back here. I never wanted to come back here. But then I heard a fit of giggles from beside me and looked over. Shanti had picked up her flag and was waving it in time to the song, her face glowing with actual amazement and delight. The encouragement from Shanti caused Priam to stand and invite Vicky into a waltz around the kitchen as they continued to sing. I tried to catch Shanti's eye to communicate my very real torment, but she just sat back in her chair, trained her eyes on the dancing duo, and kept waving the damn flag. Giving up on any hopes of making an early departure from this celebration, I slumped back in my chair, folded my arms, and glared as hard as I could at Priam and Vicky, who were somehow incorporating at least four or five different dance styles into a number that, as far as I knew of the musical, was normally performed standing perfectly still. But then, there was nothing normal about this. As I watched them flounce around the kitchen with Shanti's rainbow flag flicking every so often into my sight line, the past 12 hours seeped into my brain. The thorny situation with Kat, an amazing but still mystifying night with Shanti, and now this. The only thing I'd set out to do, kill it on the track, had so far been complicated by confusing dynamics. And the kind of stuff I avoided like the plague, intimacy, my aunt and uncle, musicals, seemed to be invading me from all sides. 
Just as these thoughts began to set panic alight in my chest once again, Priam and Vicky were reaching the climax of the song and trying to replicate the numerous voices emerging out of our stereo from the living room, including the one that goes super high at the end. As both of them tried to reach that note, Shanti reached over and seized my hand, finally turning her head my way to look at me with what could only be described as a combination of amusement, disbelief, and euphoria. I'll admit it was difficult for my displeasure and panic to sustain itself in the face of her surprising but equally enduring reaction. But surpri what surprised me even more was when she squeezed the crap out of my hand in her excitement and what I felt instead of the usual pain in my palm was something else entirely in my chest. After the show stopping number ended, Vicky and Priam took their bows, something they found a way to squeeze in at least six or seven times a day and seated themselves back at the table. Still beaming at us through slightly heavier breaths, they began eating their breakfast. Shanti looked at me, shrugged, and let go of my hand to start eating as well. Thank you. So great. <laughs> Uh, well, we have a pretty diverse group of stories here, which I love, uh, romance, YA, contemporary fiction, um, but all of your books are at least partially set in Vancouver, and since this is a Vancouver pop-up pride, um, I'd love to hear a little bit about what it is about this city um, that inspired you to set your story here. Um, Michelle, would you like to go first? Sure, yeah. So, um... I'm from Calgary, uh, so I moved to Vancouver in 2014, and I just think the city has such a long history of not just queer existence, but queer resistance as well, that being here as a queer person with, you know, ha having Davy, having commercial, they're just physical spaces where queer people exist and have existed for generations, um, and that just felt, I don't know, like the place where I could picture queer people living and thriving. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a great city for that. Uh, Danny or Tanya, do you have any thoughts about setting your books in Vancouver? Yeah, well, I'll just say, I mean, I actually don't even name Vancouver um, in Bruise, but it it's definitely what was, I was thinking of when I was writing the book, partially because um, the roller derby scene uh, is quite different depending on what city you're in. And um, I don't play roller derby myself, but I'm more familiar, of course, with the roller derby uh, league here and the sort of, I guess, the culture of it a little bit more. And um, and both of my books are set sort of on the Pacific West Coast somewhere, and I never actually named the city. Um, but it just felt right to, to try and um, base it around, I guess, the roller derby culture here versus somewhere else that I wasn't familiar, familiar with. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, for me, to be honest, like when I was writing the book, one of the thoughts that uh, came to mind is that I could set, because half of the book is set in Damascus and the other half is set in Vancouver, and literally there are 20 chapters and there are 10 of them are titled Vancouver over and over. Um, and I could have, if I wanted to sell the book, if I wanted to ensure that I sell the book in uh, in the US market, I could have switched that to Seattle. And for the non-traveling uh, American, regular American person that would have been, I, I wouldn't have to change much, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I think Vancouver is, is a place that means a lot to me. It's a place where I found maturity, where I found uh, my 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 place in the world where where I felt that I have arrived to to a place where I see myself expanding and becoming who I wanted to be. So I think I wanted to honor this place through that through um, looking at the character who in my book also arrives one way or another in a very convoluted way into becoming the person he's he's, he's supposed to be. Yeah, oh, that's lovely. Um, that kind of speaks to, um, this is a panel about uh, queer creativity, um, the value of queer stories, um, and unofficially uh, about queer joy. I know that a lot of times both 
personally, just as being queer people in the world, um, we experience trauma. And in each of your books, there are elements of trauma either on the page or in this background uh, stories that are still resonating throughout the book. Um, why did each of you decide to, to handle trauma in the way that you did? Um, and why was it important that you address it in that way? I, I can I can I can go first if if folks are comfortable with that. Um, I think we are complex as humans to begin with. I think that when we think of trauma, we there are three layers of what that means. There is what actually happened. So the traumatic event that if we had a camera focused on that traumatic event and that camera recorded everything, that's what happened. Um, and there's what we think actually happened. So us as a traumatized, traumatized person, what we think is, um, is, is happening to us or happened to us and what is the impact of that trauma on us. And then what we're willing to share about that trauma, what we're willing to talk about to others, to ourselves, on our pages. And I think that navigating those three layers is, um, is quite inviting to me, to be honest. Like, I know that I'm navigating trauma and that trauma is difficult in itself, but actually looking at those three layers and how I can take them into the creativity of my book and turn them into a character just, just is, is a lot of fun to me. Mm -hmm. And I think that that comes through when I'm writing the book. Um, it comes through the, the complexity of how I write about trauma and the joy that I, I try to show people seeking at the end of the day, the resilience that they, they, they show through understanding those three layers of their trauma, traumatic experience. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I like the idea of trauma as a character. Uh, it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, same here. I, I find that really resonates with me just in terms of the writing process and what's what our stories tend to revolve around. Um, you know, the wounds, I guess, that we that we experience um, and as humans and then as, as um, in our characters that propel us forward, right? In our lives that sort of drive what we're trying to achieve or what we think we need. Um, and so, you know, with both, uh, both books, but maybe more so bruised, um, I was asking the question, you know, why would somebody be attracted to roller derby? And of course, there's lots of reasons, but um, what came out was um, this this girl who was grieving um, and who had made a, a trauma mean something really specific that she needed to then address in a in a way that was actually really unhealthy, mm -hmm. um, but that um, that made sense for, I think how, especially because I write for, for young adults too, and I'm writing teenage stories. Um, it's really hard, it's a hard time. And we make so many things mean so much, I think more so at that age and, um, you know, everything's so big um, around that time. And, and of course, so if something is already big, <laughs> you know, the, the character makes it even, even mean so much more. And so she, my, my character, Daya, really, um, it was important to, to treat that grief that she's experiencing and what she makes that, that trauma mean for her um, really carefully and gently. And um, especially when I'm writing for young adults who I also teach you know, all the time too, um, to hold them gently as well. I think that's what I think about a lot when I'm writing um about trauma or grief or these painful things in my writing is is who who is my main audience um what are they already experiencing how are they gonna you know interact with these things um and so that's why the joy part is is so important too i find that I, for me it has to balance out mm. yeah I, sorry i really like what you're saying there tanya and yeah i think p trauma can be so personal and so individual um, and like how Danny's saying, like you, you choose what you share or don't share. So I think in my books, I really liked having individuals struggling with something traumatic, but then it's their chosen family, or in this case, their werewolf pack, um, who's like there to help and support and like um, hold your hand as you move through something that's difficult. Maybe they can't fix it for you. Maybe they can't 
hurt whoever hurt you, but maybe they can be there while you heal. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's something valuable for our community to have and to hear that you're not alone in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that, Um, both within the books and it makes me think of by the stories that each of you have written, that is not being alone. So everybody who gets to read your stories has that feeling of, oh, someone understands like what I'm going through or, or those feelings that come with those experiences. And so you are kind of being found families to each of your readers, which is beautiful. Mm. Very nice thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we move on to the next question, it's kind of um, a weird segue. I didn't think this through, but we do uh, have a couple um, gift cards to give away. Um, so what we're going to do is everybody who is watching right now, you can put in the chat, um, both on Twitch and at the Vancouver Pride Facebook uh, page, a number between one and a hundred. Uh, and we will randomly draw a winner uh, that will be announced at the end of the stream. Uh, but so right now you can get to it, put in a number between one and a hundred, uh, try not to duplicate a number if you're going through the chat uh, and we will come back to that at the end. And we will have two lucky winners who get a $25 gift card to Iron Dog Books. Um, so back to the conversation. Um, As we said, very diverse um, group of stories that are being told. Um, We are all united by an aspect of our identity that we all identify as queer in some way, Um, but that is just one aspect of our identities. And I know that um, each of you bring your whole self uh, when you write a book. So I'd love to know about what other aspects of your identity you wanted to infuse your writing with um, and how you did that, why it was important, uh, just kind of all of those intersections of identity and how you represent that. Uh, Yeah, so I can go first, that's all right. Um, So I'm polyamorous, I identify as solo poly. um, And that's a little tricky in the romance world, like romance as a genre is very much one person, two people, they're together, happy ending forever. Um, So in my third book, Moon Illusion, I really wanted to just include some polyamory in a, you know, this isn't, the love story is still between like two characters, um, but one of the characters happens to have like another relationship on the side, you know, like casually dating. Um, And that doesn't go away. Like, even though there's this big epic romance between my two main characters, um, one of them's still polyamorous and that's not an issue. It doesn't come up. It doesn't like present a problem. Um, It just is the way that people are in our community sometimes. Um, And I think it's important to show, especially in like the romance genre, that not queer love stories aren't necessarily gonna look the same way the the heterosexual love stories we've been seeing for decades, right? So I think it's nice to kind of like elbow out a bit of space there. Um, Yeah, yeah, that creativity that queer stories offer of it's not just a difference in gender or sexuality, but also in what relationships can look like. That's awesome that you're representing that. Um, I'll just um, just add that for me, it was really important to um, that my protagonists were uh, brown um, and they're Sri Lankan, uh, which is where my parents are from, um, which is it's very rare to see um, South Asians who are not Indian. Um, Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that that actually didn't come supernaturally at the very beginning. It's very strange. When I first started writing Kings, I started writing my character as a white character because that's exactly what was going through my brain all the time because that's what we've been reading. Um, You know, I've been reading my whole life. And so I actually had to make a a intentional shift um, Mm -hmm. to write my character um, as as Sri Lankan. And and now it's it comes very naturally and it um, makes a lot of sense to me. But um, it's it's still very intentional um, and intentional to make sure that actually I would say like the majority of my characters are not white um, mm-hmm. and and that is really intentional. Um, I think it's funny. I think that, so I was on a panel in 2019 
and somebody asked me, so what is your next project? And I was like, I'm going to write uh, the Foghorn Echoes, which is the book that I'm um, that I'm releasing soon. And somebody, the, the person was like, so what is it about? And I'm like, well, it's about two queer Syrian refugees who one of them is doing this and one of them is doing that. And, and the person paused and was like, isn't the clothesline swing about two queer Syrian refugees? I'm like, that's exactly the point. That is literally what I want to do because I didn't write the manual on queer Syrian refugees. This is not how storytelling works. Uh, I didn't write um, Syrian refugees, Syrian queer refugees for dummies. This is this is a novel that I wrote, and now I wrote a different novel. Um, so that question and that situation really stayed with me. Um, and one thing that I insisted on doing is that my new characters have nothing to do with me. Like I, the first characters in the clothesline swing have a lot to do with me. There are storytellers, there are people who like video games, there are people who are um, quite loving, quite outwardly with their emotions, uh, which I think of myself as that kind of person. But the Foghorn Echo is just because I want to divert as much as possible from there, while also keeping the characters gay and Syrian and refugees, they literally have no intersectionality with who I am otherwise. They're just gay Syrian refugees, just like the, pe the people in the books before them. Yeah, I love that, that you didn't write the manual. That's a good line. <laughs> um, one of the things that we talked briefly about before we went live, um, was about D and uh, I love D and D. It's collaborative storytelling, um, and one of the things that I have noticed is that when I play with queer people, the stories that we come up with are often very chaotic, very creative, uh, and usually they don't really care too much about the rules. Um, and so I find that it just opens things up uh, in a really awesome way. Uh, and since this is a panel about the value and creativity of queer stories, I'd love to hear from each of you. What do you think a queer perspective offers when you're telling stories? Well, I think just building off what you said, um, you know, I can only speak from my my queer perspective, but um, I think that that open endedness or that like room, I think is part of it. Um, at least I feel that, that I'm not as bound maybe to certain, um, I don't know, tropes or expectations um, in maybe some ways that that um, other authors might be. And I, I feel like because there is a lot of fluidity in gender and sexuality that I can move in those spaces a bit more easily, or at least I feel like that um, for myself. I know not everybody feels the freedom to do that. Um, and so I, in my books, um, I, I feel like it, it provides more variety in my characters of, of the kinds of people, the kinds of stories, the kinds of um, identities that they inhabit. Um, yeah, I feel a little bit more freedom, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love a good trope, but we also need new ones. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I think too, when you're always kind of looking outside of what society is or what it's supposed to be, it can be really interesting to turn that othering lens like back on what we consider to be normal. Um, I think queer writing has a really interesting, it can do that really interestingly, right? Um, just turning things on their head and like, oh, I really didn't think that that's weird. But when you put it like that, when you frame it this way, when I'm looking at it from this perspective, instead of straight on, like, oh, Maybe there are things here that aren't natural. Instead of straight on, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually a professional um, writer, so. <laughs> I, I don't know what queer perspective offers into storytelling, but what I know is that I'm so tired of straight perspective and their offering storytelling. They, we have been hearing straight perspectives and their offering of storytelling for the last 300 years. And specifically white straight men and all of their stories have been written in every way possible over and under and all over the place. So 
I am, I am done with that. <laughs> and I think <laughs> offering a queer perspective, a queer intersectional perspective with some brownness in there, some indigenous in there, um, if, if, if anything else, it just offers a break from that stagnant mm. storytelling that we have seen so much of. Yeah, I agree. I, when I started reading predominantly queer books, I found it was very difficult to go back. <laughs> Especially, luckily, there's so much out there now, which is wonderful. There's no need to read straight white men anymore, so stop it. <laughs> I mean, uh, there is the, 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 the occasional straight white man that I was like, oh, okay, all right, okay, all right, okay, I see. But I, when, 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 when I say that, and the last time I read a book by a straight white man was maybe um, less which was released in 2017. So <laughs> I, I feel like it has been a couple of years now. Once every five years, they get a pass. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of the kind of, we've had a lot of opportunities for, for queer authors lately. Um, I'd love to know, you guys know a lot more than I do. Um, do you see more opportunities for queer creatives now than in the past um i guess we'll, we'll start with the positive uh, are there more opportunities and in what way i think there's definitely more demand um and, and a ya i can only speak from um the genre that i'm writing in but um like and and i see this in you know the kids i teach too like they just they also are tired of the same old stories um, and they want to see their, you know, their lives reflected. And, and I'm looking out at, you know, just one classroom of kids and there's so many identities represented and they want to see themselves. And so um, that I think why holes are really special place. Um, I've noticed for, for, um, queer stories to be told and like more queer stories like like Danny was saying you know like you can tell two stories about two Syrian refugees who are queer but they are going to be completely different every single story is going to be completely different um and we need more you know we need a critical mass of stories mm -hmm. um uh, of queer stories to really represent everything that's going on and what we're seeing in the real world I mean, that's the next uh, book panel title, Critical Mass of Queer Stories. <laughs> I was just about to say Critical Mass of Queer Stories. That sounds like my kind of afternoon. Um, <laughs> I, I appreciate you saying that. I think, I think there's a lot of demand for queer stories, but what I think is the challenge is that there's still a table that has chairs that needs to be filled so there are there's a table with like i don't know 24 chairs and 20 uh, 20 of them is for white straight authors and then those four chairs over there you for queer folks of color you fo folks of color all of you you can play musical chairs on those four chairs uh each of you will be released um once every five years and that's that's i I, I, I don't want to play that game. Honestly, I don't want to play that game. I want to release a book every other year. I want, I don't want to be the only queer Syrian writer out there. And I am the only queer Syrian writer out there, unless, unless you're listening, queer Syrian writers, and you want, please, please talk to me. I'm on Twitter. I have like 10,000 followers. Please come to me um, and let's talk. But Currently, I, I feel that I'm the only person over there from my identity, from my little queer community. And I don't think that that's, I don't think that that's cool. And I, I think that there's a lot of opportunities way more than, I don't know, five years ago. But that doesn't mean that the options are not still limited. Mm. Yeah, I would really agree with that. Um, and I think, too, we have to look maybe also just outside of traditional narrative storytelling. Like we were talking about video games a bit earlier. And I think we're seeing a lot, a lot more queer storylines in video games and stuff. Um, and I know mobile gaming, like that's a huge thing. Um, and you know, there are lots of the like online mobile games that are kind of like role-playing based. A lot of those are queer. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I do think there are opportunities, but like Danny's saying, there's a cap too on how much money and resources are available to the non-normative folks out there so it does it can be 
competitive against each other in ways that are really not mm. helpful. Mm. When again, there are 20 other seats open up some of those. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, and like the funny thing is like the best selling lists in Canada released every week from the CBC, 90% of the people on the top 10 are people of color or queer people. It's clearly that the community out there, the mainstream community wants our stories. Yeah. And and I, I, I don't know, I'm not one of those like Scrooge McDuck writers who just wants the space for myself. I actually want you to come and swim with me in that pile of money in my, <laughs> in my locker. Not that I have one, but uh, we didn't want to talk about the money in my locker. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I just, I just feel, I just feel like, I, I just feel like I, I just feel like there are certain barriers that makes no sense that they're just there now just because they have been there for for since the beginning of time and and they just makes no sense anymore and i think we all can easily jump them yeah do you have any advice for any viewers out there who want to get into storytelling into writing um as queer people do you have any encouragement or, or practical advice that, that you think would be useful? Um, I just say that you, you have to be the person that's going to defend your own work the most. Like publishing really can be, it's an industry, right? It's capitalism. They really care about money at the end of it. So you have to know that even if you have a really good relationship with your publisher, with your editors, like at the end of the day, you have to stand up for what you know is right in your writing. Um, and that can be tough but you're the author, you know, it's, you can listen to advice, people can come to you and you can take in criticism, but at the end of the day, you have to go with your gut. Um, and your story needs you to stand behind it because no one else is going to, we don't have the resources really in this community for you to have a whole team for a lot of us. So mm -hmm. just know that, yeah, you got this. No, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Love that. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, that the you might not have the team in the industry part, but it, I think you have a team here. Like I, I have found at least for myself that um, the queer community, the um, you know folks of color um, who are writers have been really supportive um, and and welcoming and want to help um, and you know form groups. So like reach out, don't be you know like what's the worst is that you won't hear back, you know. But um, in my experience, I almost always hear back, and so you know find that find support that way, and don't be afraid to ask um, for just even for advice or you know a connection. Um, I think people are pretty willing to to help when they can. I think um, I, I echo um, search for your community and and uh, blow your own horn because nobody else would do it for you. I echo that completely. Um, and I say be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. A lot of us, when we're writing, the first thought that comes to my mind is this is shit. All of this is shit. I hate this. This is the worst. Please stop and go play your video. And I don't think I don't think that's um, <clears throat> every book that is printed out there in a book store that you read is not the first draft that the author put together. It's never that. Um, there is five, six drafts, please, for me, 20. Um, there is um, agents that get involved, editors that get involved, copy editors that get involved your neighbor's dog gets involved, everybody gets involved. So really believe me, the moment that you sit down and you write a word, you're not going to write the next masterpiece. It's going to be shit and that is totally fine. Just be kind to it and see how it can grow into something beautiful. Mm. Uh, speaking of those, those projects that are growing into something beautiful, uh, I do want to, not our last question, but second to last, um, hear from each of you about any upcoming projects that are, are coming up, uh, any books we should uh, put in our queues uh, on Goodreads, um, or any anything else that you, you want viewers to know about. 
Um, I'll just go first. I'm not working on anything. I'm just trying to survive a pandemic right now. So hop off that grind culture for a bit. But I'll just take one small second to plug Autostraddle. If you're interested in queer writing, it's like the only independently run queer women's media site. And they publish a lot of really interesting work from like new up and coming writers. Um, and they're really trans inclusive and they're working really closely to, yeah, just bring a really inclusive um, queer women's independent media site. So they run largely on just subscriptions and donations. So it would mean a lot to me if you just check them out. Mm -hmm. yeah, second that. A third that. <laughs> really cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll just mention, so I'm just working on a couple of projects. Um, one definitely YA, one maybe crossing over. Um, one of them goes back into the drag world, but is not connected to my first book. Um, I just felt like Vancouver has this unreal drag scene um, and there's so much more to say about it than what I could um, add into Kings. And so, um, yeah, I wanted to go back in there and and I've got to like interview all of these amazing drag performers and in the um, in the journey to, to finishing the book. So I'm getting to the end of that and um, hoping to find a home for it at some point. Um, and then the other book I'm working on um, dives into the intersection between religion and queerness. Um, and that's the YA one. Um, I was raised Catholic. <laughs> and so um, I have a lot to say about that particular intersection. Um, I've always wanted to write about it. And so, um, yeah, I'm really excited to, to continue diving into that world and see some of the complications and, and also some of the maybe hopefully um, hopeful parts to bring out for, for a lot of kids who are trying to figure that out as well. Awesome. Is there... A, a date attached to any of this or it's still very much this is okay. all just hoping <laughs> <laughs> excellent well I'm going to be on the lookout that sounds great <laughs> um before we do our winning uh drawing I would love to know um everybody who's watching should definitely uh read all of your books and when they've finished that if they're looking for even more recommendations, uh, do, do you have um, any queer books that you just think are excellent and that you want everybody to read? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking at my pile of books right now. Uh, this is uh, a collection of poetry by my friend Charlie Pitch, uh, Why I Was Late, and this is uh, beautiful. Uh, they're a trans masculine person who lives in Toronto. They are super freaking funny and they deserve to for you to pick up this book. It's amazing. Um, I have also, I just finished um, Sure, I'll Be Your Black Friend by Ben uh, Philip, which I met Ben and he is a dream. He is such a cute boy. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. Um, and finally, last but not least, is um, my friend Cicely Bell uh, Blaine had a collection of poetry called Burning Sugar. And that is also quite fantastic. It's about spirituality. It's about connection to family. It's about queerness. It's about growing up Black. It's, it's a lot of things. And I adored it. Um, I really loved the Little Blue Encyclopedia for Vivian, um, which is also, I think it's set in Vancouver. It's definitely set in BC. Um, and it's a, a trans author. It's a really, just a charming, I can't, there are these beautiful illustrations. Like it's just a great book if you have a chance. 10 out of 10. Um, I had to write mine down because I always forget when people ask this question, my mind <laughs> immediately goes blank. Um, but I'll, I'll just give you my, some of my top, top YA, queer YA. Um, one is Juliet Takes a Breath by Gabby Rivera. Um, super cool, set in the 90s feminist kind of um, story, uh, like a love story um, by Abdeen Nazimian. Um, it's a couple years older, but uh, unbelievable. I just read it. Um, Last Night at the Telegraph Club. 
by Melinda Lowe. If you haven't read that yet, it is incredible. The research, the history, just so much going on. Um, and then a recent one, I get to meet Lizelle Sambury recently. We did an event together and I'm just in the middle of um, the audiobook of Blood Like Magic. Um, so if you like fantasy, it is so good. There's so much going on in it. Um, and then my last one is One Last Stop. It's not YA um, by Casey McQuinson, but um, it could be YA too. It's just super awesome, like kind of supernatural, queer, female romance. Pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, I love those. Um, mm. I would also throw in there, if you like sci-fi, The Long Way to the Small Angry Planet by Becky Chambers is very good. Um, and if you like things set on earth, <laughs> um, Aristotle and Dante discover the secrets of the universe is excellent. And the sequel just came out this year. Long awaited, I think we had to wait 10 years. Uh, and Butter Honey Pig Bread is also really excellent. Uh, so hopefully this keeps your bookshelves full uh, for the next few weeks, a <laughs> few months. Um, as we close out, uh, we are going to announce our winners. Uh, the first number we had was 51, uh, which I am told was Cheeseboard Gaming. No, just kidding. That was 50. 51 was Dawson Bisgard uh, on Facebook. And the second number was 35, which is Cheeseboard Gaming. So don't worry, you did win. Uh, <laughs> uh, so for each of you, if you could email roarcatreads at gmail.com with your full name, email address, and postal address. We'll get those to you. So thank you for tuning in uh, and congratulations. Uh, I do want to give a huge thank you to our interpreters. Uh, you're amazing uh, and you did a phenomenal job. And thank you to each of our panelists, Michelle, Danny, and Tanya. It was great to hear from you and get to know you. And I sincerely um, encourage everybody to go buy your books immediately. I had such a good time reading them. And I'm excited for all future projects. Um, before we close out, uh, I do want to remind everyone that there are more Pop-Up Pride events coming up. Uh, the Big Top Virtual Drag Show is going to feature performers of all genders and expressions hosted by the one and only Satanics. Uh, they are bringing Scene versus Emo Part 2, uh, which will be at 9 p.m. this Friday. So you can check out vancouverpride.ca slash events for any info for that uh, program. And the show will also have ASL interpretation thanks to Vancouver Pride Society and TD. Uh, so thank you all for being here and thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, I hope you all have a great night and uh, that you fall asleep reading a queer book. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much, Trisha.